the assumption we make here is that there is a God, that he does listen, and what's more, not only is this place filled with sacred objects, you are sacred. We work on the assumption that you are a sacred thing and will treat you accordingly when you're here. And uh, it has enormous power. It's, it's a nice paradox, isn't it, that um, in one way, because of Wall association with the traditionalist, um, mm. you know, the Catholic wing of the Church of England and all the changes going on, it's a very churchy place. Um, in another regard, um, pilgrimage and other areas like you know, monasticism show a huge spiritual hunger and thirst, yeah, which do. actually is not really to do with the Sunday church no. culture. And you will be, you're at an odd crossroads there, aren't you really? Well, I think the funny thing is the shrines, and I've just come back from the um, meeting of the Marian Shrine Directors of Europe, which I go to. Mm. Uh, very interesting. I mean, if there was a conference of Anglican Marian Shrine Directors, I'd be the only one there. Shrine Directors of anything. Of anything. Really, yeah. um, um, uh, they're all experiencing the same thing about you know, in, in Western Europe anyway. Mm. But what, what, what is interesting is that somehow this is, a this is a churchy place, but actually it's not very institutionally churchy. Mm. It, it, yeah. uh, it, um, and I think that that's the other wound for us, is that we're in a culture at the moment which is very suspicious of institutions and don't look to institutions for any form of renewal. Yeah. It's not just the church. Mm. And that's why the deinstitutionalizing of the church is, is, is very important, it seems to me. Uh, not church's body of Christ, but the institutional stuff. Mm. Um, um, so that people don't have to climb through institutionalism to get to Christ, if yeah. I can put it that yeah. way. Um, and we, we Anglo-Catholics have probably not helped in some ways because we, our language, we, we drift into language of church all the time too much and, and that needs to be reinterpreted to people. So we say the Eucharist is something the church does. Yeah. Um, in that case, yes. I'm not interested then. Yes, if you explain what, that, that's what, quite an yeah, inviting yeah, but, but if you say <laughs> the, the yeah. Eucharist is something Jesus does with his church, yeah. this is Christ. This is Christ we're going to meet here. Christ making the church. There's the yeah. possibility when you come here that you're going to meet Jesus Christ and have an encounter with him. And that's all that matters. Yeah. That's all that matters. Uh, and we're not here to sign you up. Yeah. Um, uh, and somehow that's very evangelical language. I suppose, or could be seen to be so. I just think that's Catholic language. That's yeah, the, that's yeah. the, and we've got perhaps to take some bold steps about leaving behind some stuff that we think is essential, hmm. or have thought to be essential. This, well, I've, even I've, Cardinal Martini thought they were <laughs> pompous, didn't he? Oh well. That's an interesting point. At least it's not purple. <laughs> hey, it's, it's plain purple black. Color. It's plain okay. black. <laughs> but, but, but actually, I'm not, I'm not sure I agree with Cardinal Martini about that. There's a way of wearing a cassock which makes you pompous. There's a way of wearing a black suit that makes you pompous. Pomposity <laughs> it's is not, the is not and, is, and is not to do with the clothes. Okay. Uh, I just, just want to pick up <laughs> one other sort of mm. interest uh, as we wrap up. I'm working in a parish at the moment in mm. St. Bedford with amazing resources. Um, for work with young people mm. and a great heart for it. We're sort of going through a bit of a process looking at, <clears throat> you know, some things we might be able to do differently. I know youth ministry is um, a, a passion of yours mm. and that um, it's been quite an interesting sort of development in, in the sort of flavour of Walsingham mm. that uh, work with youth is now mm. very prominent, whereas I don't think people thought of Walsingham. Well, it was uh, uh, Philip North, my predecessor, really began that work. It's not, it's not my work, mm. although I'm absolutely in sympathy with But I'm it. just wondering what kind of response you get from them. Why, why do you think they are important for the church? Why do you think the church is important for them? Well, if they're going to be fully alive, they need Jesus Christ in their life. It's not that the church is important for them. The church is the agent of God. It's God that's important. So, so a young person, a human being, is not fully alive, it seems to me, without, without them than opening themselves up to the possibility of Christ dwelling within their hearts. Authentically lived Christian love is the only thing that can bring about transformation. And I think this is imp important, going back to the other issue we were talking about, in that, in that um, the renewal of the church historically, and I'm, I have to be careful, I'm not a church historian, but as far as I can see, 
doesn't generally happen by pronouncement. Mm. It happens by a company of people discovering sometimes, even though they belonged for a considerable time, discovering as if for the first time uh, the possibility of a relationship with Jesus Christ and the impact that will have on the way you live your life in the world. Uh, uh, when just a few, do, that happens to a mm. few people by God's grace. <clears throat> and it seems to me in, in, in historically, um, you, know, you asked what's it gonna be like, unimaginable in the next 40 years mm. for a young priest now. We must pray that the Lord will do what he's done in other generations. Mm. By surprise, often. By surprise. By surprise, a Francis, an let's, Augustine. Let's just get back though, because I, I, I am interested to know um, what, it is it, what is it that inspires you about working with young people and how it works here. Okay. Because in a, in a way, it would seem very counterintuitive that Walsingham would be a natural place for this to happen. But clearly, clearly something does touch them, and I assume mm. things also happen to Walsingham through their presence. Oh, it, it, absolutely transforming. Even having four young people here on our Year for God scheme has been transforming to our lives uh, in ways I can't put into words. It's extraordinary. Have a go. Well, like, uh, it would probably have been unimaginable 50 years ago for a 19-year-old to be leading evening prayer when there's a priest sitting in the stall next mm. to them. I mean, it's a small thing. You know, just hearing the voices of young people leading worship. Mm. Young 85-year-old ladies coming for the laying on of hands by a 22-year-old mm. layperson. This sort of inverts mm. in some way. And it just happens naturally. It just, it just, it's just happened naturally. There's been no resistance at all. Mm. Just joy in it, actually. Yeah. Um, so the, I think that what, in terms of technique, uh, you know, and with this, you say it seems counterintuitive for this to happen at Walsingham. Walsingham, ab above all places, is a reminder that the whole thing began with a 15-year-old girl, for yeah. goodness sake. <laughs> with God, by surprise, filling a 15-year-old girl with his grace. Yeah. So, if this place doesn't care about young people, if this place doesn't expect young people to be used by God uh, for his glory, and, and uh, open them open them up to that possibility, I mean, mm. what sure. else is going to Okay, so, but what happens to them when they come here? I don't mean what do they do, but okay. spiritually, personally? Well, I, I would say what why, happens... Why does this work? Well, I think it, it goes back to what I was saying about shrines and the 24-7-ness of it, mm. frankly. I think, um, and, and of course, to go back to a word we've touched on, respect. That is, we treat young people with respect. I remember a group from Sweden came and their, their priest, a woman priest actually, lovely person, brought a group of, of teenagers. She said, I'm bringing them to Walsingham because I can't find anywhere in Sweden where they talk about Jesus. Now that may not be true, but that's what she said. Mm. So unashamedly, she said, we're scared to talk about him in the church. Mm. Um, so anyway, she said, but I need to tell you some of the problems. I said, no, I don't want to hear them. I don't want to hear these problems at all. I don't want to hear whether they're OCD or whatever they are. And that's why because no, no interest. They've come through that arch. Mm. They will be treated with respect and love just because they're made in God's image. And that's what we're hunting for. Mm. Now that sounds pious, but that's, that's the technique. And uh, one of those lads, I went back to Sweden earlier this year, and one of those lads, his, his mother came to a service I was preaching at because she said to me, I don't know what happened when he came to Walsing, but it's changed his life. Mm. He, he came back a different person. This was a boy who had been troublesome. He was doing his confirmation preparation because in Sweden you have to do it. Mm. And you know, it's still culturally very acceptable, even if you're not a church guy. Um, he was scrapping to carry the image on Wednesday night in the procession. Mm. You know, unimaginable three days before. Yeah. And I think it's something that to do with immersion. Mm. In a place like this, they're immersed in the love of Christ and actually, I, though with failings, in love from brothers and sisters, in, 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 in love from people. Mm. And that's, that's, I mean, it's not rocket science, love God and love your neighbour. That's mm. all it is. Mm. I mean, we, how long have we spent? No, I think, I mean, my, my experience is that young people are not impressed by anything half-hearted or wishy-washy or, or vague. Actually, the fact that it's 
uh, you know, it's, a, it's a committee, and as you say, it's around the clock. Yeah, and they don't, life, they, and, and, they, and they don't have to become old people in order to do mm. it. I mean, I think unwittingly, unwittingly in the church sometimes we've we've expected, well, we expect non-Christians to understand the sacred too quickly, to understand the rules and regulations, yeah. the, and the behaviour patterns too quickly. So we expect them to be converted before they are, and we certainly unwittingly have expected young people to be old in order to be acceptable to us. Uh, it's, un it's, un it's unintended, but I think that's what we've done. And I think that here, we just let teenagers be teenagers. Mm. Uh, and actually, unless you listen, how, uh, I mean, you're not as old as I am, anywhere near it. But neither of us know what it's like to be a 15-year-old mm. now. So unless we listen, how will we know? How will we know? Uh, it's interesting, um, there was a, 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 a woman priest who came here, who I know fairly well actually, and we, we do have quite a lot of women clergy come in. And she said to me, Lindsay, you are so confusing. You know, you love young people, you get young people here, you preach, you're enthusiastic about the gospel. You're just not the type to be opposed to the ordination <laughs> of women. <laughs> and um, there we are. I mean, uh, that itself speaks of a sort of um, pigeonholing, I suppose, that yeah. we were talking about yeah. for, uh, uh, before. And in a sort of um, maybe perverse sort of way, I'm glad to be confusing. I'm glad to be confusing. <laughs> well, it's, it's just over two years since we did this before. Interesting to think where we'll all be in another couple of years. Mm. But thanks for talking. Simon, it's a pleasure. <laughs>